We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? Bad idea. Welcome back to O'Reilly Radio 135E. This is the Bad Idea segment recorded Friday, December 9th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go O'Reilly. Oh, I'm your host, Andy Cowell, with my usual suspects, Stephen Griffith and Daniel Atherton. Okie dokie. So, um, we had some good ideas there, but now we've got uh, bad ideas. we got we got some serious veggies uh, uh, to yep. work through here. So, <clears throat> protesters denied permits based on DC foot dragging. What is going on here, Daniel? Okay, so none of the inauguration protests have their proper permits yet, and it is primarily due to the Presidential Inauguration Committee. Um, Because the National Park Service, which handles the permitting, Mm -hmm. uh, cannot grant any requests until the Presidential Inaugural Committee which plans the parade and other events to usher in a new president, maps out where it wants to hold the inauguration-related activities. Oh, and they uh, haven't done shit. Okay. No, they haven't done anything. Nice. That's They're the too surprise. busy grandstanding all around the country instead. Yeah, uh... they're dragging their feet on this. And, again, it, it smells like they're going to continue to drag their feet so the protests cannot be planned properly, and they cannot be issued their proper permits. Now, do you think that that's on purpose, or do you think it's just... Yes, I you do? fully believe it's premeditated. Because it, it, putting my, my, my somewhat tinfoiled but gold-lined tinfoiled hat, and if I were on, on Trump's transition committee, knowing everything that I know... If I'm trying to protect him, we'll keep the president-elect distracted as much as possible, and we will drag this out as long as possible to make it so that those planning to protest have to rush at the last second. Hmm. I'm not saying it's him. I'm saying it's the people around him. Or they'll just say, screw it, don't care, and they'll, you know, as far as the protesters are concerned... You know, they'll either not care and do like what a lot of big protests have done back in the past, and we don't care about permits, we're just going to do this thing, and as a form of civil disobedience in a way, and just risk, you know, risk the arrest. I imagine that will happen. Also saying, if they don't give it to you, screw it, just go. If there's a yeah, but you, they they're won't not be... really going to stop you. Yeah, but this is going to curtail the numbers. It because will curtail... all the other really big protests that have happened yeah. in recent history. It will curtail organized protest. Yeah. It won't curtail the disorganized stuff, which there will, there will still be, but it curtails the, the, the formal, organized, peaceful protest. It makes the protesters look bad because the disorganized stuff is going to look bad. Um... And I know if I were on his transition team, hearing everything I, I hear, seeing everything I see, and I'm, I'm being employed to protect this man, this is what I would do. Hmm. I'm not saying it's him. I'm saying it's the people around him. <clears throat> this is always the way it happens, Literus said. What makes this so complicated is that not only is this the inauguration, but because there has been so much interest on both sides of this election, we are seeing all of these extra events that want to take place at the same time. Yeah. People's Action, a national organization promoting democracy and economic fairness, applied on November 14th for a permit for 2,000 people to demonstrate on the Washington Monument grounds between January 19th and January 21st. Kathy Mullady, the press secretary, said she is now unsure of how the group will prepare. They're in a holding pattern. What can we do? Don't have... Yeah. It's, uh, it's the way it's going to be. So, okay, the National Park Service asked groups of 25 people or more wishing to rally or demonstrate to apply for a First Amendment permit, which is free. 
protesting without a permit on federal park land does not necessarily mean that a group would be asked to leave, said Sergeant Anna Rose, a spokeswoman for the park police. It would depend on what else is going on at the time, Rose wrote in an email. We pride ourselves on facilitating everyone's right to free speech, and every effort is made to allow visitors to exercise that right. So there you go. Yeah. It's just if you're going to happen to have a gaggle of people, a gaggle for my purposes here being 25 or more, uh, you're, you're going to have to stand in line and get a permit or break into smaller groups and go stand elsewhere. So you got that option. Maybe three groups of ten. Work on that. <laughs> Again. A couple groups just, of twenty, you know? It's it's another thing to inconvenience those that don't like the person you want. <clears throat> Two thousand groups of five. Yeah, but all wear different colored shirts. You know, okay, group you know, group one wear, you know, turquoise. Okay, group group two. We're yellow. Group three, <laughs> you know, so on and so forth. That way it's like, no, we're not with them. They're wearing different shirts. We just happen to be standing next to them. We're not with them. <laughs> I mean, is it obvious? I mean, look. Yeah. Uniforms. <laughs> we're trying to make this as plain and easy for you as we can, officer. There's That's right. So yeah. We can do. Yep. <laughs> I mean, we've got signs. They're in different font. <laughs> They say you the same the thing. The that I'm using, we went to we went to that Walmart over there, not that exactly, one over there. Exactly, exactly. We we cleared them out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, it is. Uh, it, it does end up being a little bit laughable at some point, but you know, we. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So denied by inaction. Classic stalling technique. Pretty good. Mm. Pretty good. So let's talk about Wells Fargo. You got a couple stories that you, that you pulled in here that are definitely in our wheelhouse of things to talk about. Yeah. Um, um, as we reported on earlier in the year, um, Wells Fargo has been a naughty, naughty bank. Um, and the bank has s- sought to kill tons of lawsuits Uh that its customers have filed over the creation of as many as 2 million sham accounts by moving the cases into private arbitration, a secretive legal process that often favors corporations. The Um, sham accounts, just to to recap that for those that uh, that missed that story, Uh, basically in uh, several months ago, and actually for a long time before that, uh, Wells Fargo has... Uh, policies in place that made it in the employee's best interest to fluff up their numbers to get bonuses by creating new accounts for people. It was basically, you know, how many accounts can you open, you know, during they a were pre- during a pay period. They were pressured kind of to commit fraud. And then rewarded handsomely for it. Yes. Which incentivized them to do so a lot. So that's basically what it was. They they would transfer fifty dollars or whatever the opening fee was, you know, to and they transfer that into a new account and then immediately transfer it back once the new account was created. And the and new account would be created account. for just long enough to register, and then they would close that account too. Now, however, every time that happened, it also generated all the paperwork involved. So new new account opening everything here and there and there. And it could also impact the customer in creating a credit check on, on their account, which could, as we know, bring down their, their credit scores and all sorts of things. So it was really affecting the customers. So at this point now there is, you know, a class action with um, over 80 customers. Uh, Like the, the one here in this particular um, example is Jennifer Zelny suing Wells Fargo in federal court in Utah along with about 80 other customers over unauthorized accounts. So now that I've given the background, yeah, take it on. No. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Laney is a lawyer who lives outside Salt Lake. Um, she opened a Wells Fargo account when she started a new law practice. Uh, and again, arbitration by its nature favors the corporation. Uh, because it is not public. 
it is private. Uh, it's private dealings, and they don't have to seek a... <laughs> by the nature of arbitration, they do not have to seek a neutral arbitrator. Nope, they certainly do they not. Can, they can have somebody that's essentially on their damn payroll perform the arbitration. Right, which could uh, could involve strong-arm tactics and intimidation the whole time. Yes. Um, now... Or the, or the very simple, so what will it take for this to go away? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, he, here's where, where things get, get sticky. Is the bank's argument for the arbitration is the arbitration clauses include in the legitimate contracts that customers signed to open the bank accounts, covered disputes related to the false ones in their names, even though the arguments of those customers affected is, no, we didn't sign the agreements for the new account. But you already had an agreement with us, so that's why you have to do arbitration. That is what the banks are saying. In a statement, Wells Fargo said it was working with customers to reimburse any improper fees. If the issues are still not resolved, the bank offers free mediation services. Arbitration, the bank said, is a last resort. Isn't uh-huh. mediation arbitration? Yes, it is. Okay, just checking. I mean, I feel like if I opened the thesaurus, I might see those words next to each other. You would. Um... No, it's it's incredibly awful. It's hurting these people. Oh, <laughs> uh, although the extent of the scandal became known only in September, some fraudulent acts may have started a decade or more ago. I'm sorry, yes. I did not realize my time scale was so shifted. <sighs> yeah. Wow. Um. In 2013, a Wells Fargo customer in Los Angeles, David E. Douglas, filed a suit claiming that several bank employees had forged his signature and opened many sham accounts in his name to meet sales quotas. The actions he described in his complaint are precisely the kinds of legal acts the company acknowledged this year when it paid $185 million to settle cases brought by federal regulators and the Los Angeles city attorney. But Mr. Douglas's testimony never reached a courtroom. A judge granted Wells Fargo's request to move the case to arbitration, whisking it out of public view. And that is why they don't want it in the public view, obviously. No. And again, class actions have a habit of going for the plaintiffs. Ooh, this is nice. This is a nice little section here. The anatomy of a scandal. For years, Wells Fargo employees secretly set up fake accounts without customers' consent. Yep. <laughs> Again, and also, and here to, to fur it out, you nice. have you have employees who were fired, also either trying to help plaintiffs or suing the company themselves. So it. it it, it just keeps compounding and it keeps getting worse. And again, arbitrators are, are typically lawyers or retired judges who are paid large fees mm-hmm. to conduct these hearings. Um, and they have an economic interest in siding with the company. Yeah. They're the ones that are paying their fee. Yeah. Apparently, there was a pair of Supreme Court rulings in 2011 and 2013 that allowed for the widespread use of arbitration. I don't know what those are, but uh, I would like to look those up. So, Yeah. And again, with how suits work, Wells Fargo is going to try and keep kicking the can down the road until they can force arbitration. Or if they get a judge that they feel will rule on their side, then they'll press it forward. Otherwise, they're going to keep kicking the can down the road and try to outlive their claim. Yeah, and they can. Yeah. 
In many instances, the fees that customers were charged on the unauthorized accounts were less than $100. Few lawyers will take up individual arbitration claims when the potential damages are low. Yeah. This is meant to have a chilling effect, said Zane Christensen, a lawyer who represented customers in a suit against Wells Fargo in federal court in Utah. They know customers will have a hard time finding a lawyer to represent them in arbitration. Yeah, you could bring in, bring a lawyer into arbitration with you, but the thing is, you'd have to pay for their. You'd have to pay for them to do so, you know, yeah. and their, and their time their is money. Yeah, and while if it's actually a public court case, if they win, many times their fee is covered in, in the award to the plaintiff. Yeah, it's taken off the top, and then everybody else gets the stuff. Yeah, so it, it it essentially the lawyer pays for himself by winning the suit. Right. Yeah. Um, Which is why, why you get to... exorbitant amounts and why you have multi-million dollar settlements. Yeah. Where because where if, the individual people settle... only get like twenty five cents or something like that. That's those little checks that you'll get from you know whatever class action lawsuit that you didn't even know you were a part of. You know the the check that's less than than the stamp on the envelope. Yeah, I love those. It's like, why did you bother? I mean, really, why did you bother? So, okay, so that's that's the scandal end of Wells Fargo for yeah. arbitration. Now let's let's get into the weeds here with deregulation because, of course, Wells Fargo wants less regulation so they can do more here, here, more stuff here, here's the thing that just kind of drive me nuts is okay the previous ceo john strumpf yeah was 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 forced to to retire Abruptly. because of the scandal yeah um tim sloan who is now the new ceo of wells fargo um, wishes so very much. Um, the new boss is an awful lot like the old boss, as uh, as the song goes. Yeah, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Yeah. Um. Again, he so so much a wants a loosening of 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 a number of federal rules. And regulations um the uh tlac uh, uh the total loss absorbing capacity rule um which was i believe put in place in 2008 uh lo- alongside the tarp bailout um was a rule that requires mega banks to bulk up on capital that can be used to cushion against losses uh the rule is particularly painful to wells fargo uh, since they have acquired Wachovia, uh, and it, it estimates that they would have to sell sixty billion of long-term debt in order to, make, to meet their requirements based upon the TLAC. Um, hmm. So that way they would be able to have the money there. So should an economic downturn happen. The, the the people whose money they have taken would be protected. Interesting. Um, and again, S- Sloan wants this stuff gone because it's hurting his shareholders and it's hurting Wells Fargo's bottom line. Hmm. And he 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 is. Giddily waiting Trump's administration at, yeah. and, and hoping that Dodd Frank and the TLAC will be killed. Oh man, this is just uh, just three months ago. Regulators Dodd slapped Frank Wells. Good. Hmm? So remember, everybody, Dodd Frank is good. Yeah, Dodd Frank is good. And we need <clears throat> a return of Glass Steagall. Yeah. Um. 
Just three months ago, also, regulators slapped Wells Fargo with $185 million in fines for the opening of those fake accounts that we just talked about in the last segment. <laughs> and again, like Dodd-Frank's, there's was referred to as the Volcker Rule. Uh, and that restricts banks from essentially betting heavily with their own money. Well, uh, proprietary not... trading. Well, um, that's by creating uh, commodities out of uh, investments and selling them on the stock market, essentially, is, is what, you know, and, and creating creating a, a completely unregulated, you know, with the whole housing bubble? Yeah, that's in there. Yeah, no, this this is what they want. This is what Wells Fargo wants. Yeah, because they can just take money right off the top. Lots of money right off the top. And talking about, you know, money off the top, let's talk about South Carolina's pension crisis. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, let's let's do that. Speaking of deplorables, so you had a, you had a chance to to read through this and and it uh, it really got your blood boiling, it, it, which which means that I want to hear why it was boiling. Let's you know, <laughs> first it was boiling and then it was, I I I am stunned, I am appalled, and I'm also, by the time you read the end of this, you should either be a outraged or b have taken a a a ollie sized blow to your faith in humanity okay so overall what's the problem the problem is those that were handling south carolina's government pensions were either i i want to get the quote it, it's okay. in here um Oh, that's right. You said you said there was a golden quote in there that, yeah, you, that you had to no, remember. No, there, there there was a golden quote. Um, in the 2015 study by the Maryland Public Policy Institute stated um, by Jeff Hook, a senior fellow at the institute, one of the authors of the report. So the state's investment policy suggested either a lack of mathematical understanding, or a decision process not driven by the best interests of the pensioners and taxpayers. Um, <laughs> Edward Seidel, a former Securities and Exchange Commission lawyer who unsuccessfully sought a contract to review South Carolina's pensions, was even blunter. Uh, in a Forbes.com commentary, he called the state's pensions a ticking megaton alternative investment time bomb South Carolina pension officials created in secret with Wall Street technical assistance. Wow. Well, that's that's a claim. That's a uh, claim. So again, going we're, we're, to, we're basically saying that their their pension money was gambled away and is gone. Yeah. Again, the 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 number because this episode might as well be called this entire one three five should be called by the numbers. Twenty-four point one billion dollar shortfall for the government pension, and the plans serve roughly one out of nine state residents in South Carolina. Triple the state's annual budget. So that's that's better than ten percent of the of the population of South Carolina. Are impacted by this. Yes. This is as big, possibly bigger, than Kansas's state of affairs. And we've already covered how Kansas is completely screwed. Um, no, this is the state's biggest problem of the decade, which is an understatement. That was by Senator Kevin Bryant, um, a Republican of uh, Anderson. Uh, area in, in South Carolina. I mean, the, the thing, let me, and, let me, let me it, see it, here. I don't a, know if I can do a South Carolina accent, but I, I, let me see if I can get, get a little Southern here. Okay. Our attitude from 2006 to 2013 was we wanted to be on the cutting edge of investment diversification and financial theory, but we were on the bleeding edge, said State Treasurer Curtis Lotus, who served on the seven-member South Carolina Retirement Systems Investment Commission. 
we have lost so much money, the state will be lucky to get out of it. The, the state can't get out of it. Here's the thing. Well, they haven't been I, very lucky at the at the track here, basically. So, yeah. No, if if you look there, there's a handy dandy chart in this article. Well, let's see. Let's scroll um, down here. This one. Yeah. Buying high, high and selling, selling low. low. <laughs> so basically yeah. being stupid, being the, doing the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do. And he, here's here's the thing. They took the fund. They took these people's pensions. And they they were given all this money was given to the hands of people. I would like to think that they genuinely had these people's interests at heart. And but they gave it to a habitual gambler, a gambling addict. Yeah. And and they just kept gambling. They kept putting it in risky stocks. Again, if you want to personally do an aggressive investment uh, on something that you're thinking is going to give you a quick turnaround. You do that with maybe 5% of your investment capital because you can take that hit. Um, Because your other investments, if you put it in medium or the bulk, especially for pensions, should be in in solid investments or long term so slow growth i would like to point out something as far as growth <clears throat> and as far as the stock market in this chart which starts in the year 1994 uh, and then runs to 2016 in the 94 to 2000 run up that's almost a straight line going up it's it's fairly solid growth. It's what yeah. you expect in in slow investment no. trading. No, no, that well, no. Again, wait, no, wait. That was also Hang on. the boom. That was Clinton. Yeah, and then in two thousand, right when Bush got in, stocks drop forty two percent. Yeah. Uh, it hits. It hits, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> it hits the really rough part between oh two and oh three. Yeah. Um, and then it starts slowly climbing itself back up uh, until we hit two thousand eight, two thousand nine, when the we bottom fell out. Yeah, we had that nice little crash, and where the bottom dropped out, they happened to have sold the stocks. They sold everything. They fire sale. They panicked. Instead of holding on to what they had yeah. and letting it grow back up. They ran on the bank. They so, they, they fire sold. Yeah. And to just have lost like half their left, value. Yeah. As opposed to holding on to to those investments and letting the market recover. Um again, when the market's crashing Unless you can get that order in at the start of the crash, you yeah. don't pull your money out. Yeah, that's like half the money right there. So, you know, there's 1400 along here. That's that's roughly kind of averaging, you know, what it was in 2007. So in 2009, when they sold, it was about at 700 Yeah. And that's not the time to sell. Unless no. you can put that order in. Right as the market is turning, yeah. Unless you were some, unless you have a firm that has somebody with their finger on the pulse at every freaking second, that have have the firm of day traders. Yeah. When the market's turning down, it's like about August of two thousand eight. That's when they should have sold. You don't. <laughs> you don't sell. You hold on to those investments, right. and wait you, for it to recover. Adopt. You you adopt. A long-term view. Yeah. You go. We hold on to what we have. We may actually spend more money into what we've got, so right. that we can firm up those companies, so they can recover faster. Yeah. When it crashes, that's when you buy. Yeah. So 
put more money in, buy into what you've already got. So those companies have a quicker turnaround. You buy in because you've you're already in buy in more. Um, and then hopefully they will turn around and it's slow growth at, at, Honestly, if you are going to go for a quick turnaround and you're going to to invest aggressively, you shouldn't be doing stuff for a year. Yeah. If you're going to be aggressive, be freaking aggressive and And you're day trading. Yeah. Well, you're not even day trading. Um uh, you can you can day Mic- trade micro but transactions, that, yeah. That you don't do that with chunks. You don't do it with that much money. No. You do it with with small percentages and try and, and net off the day trade. If you're doing just an aggressive thing, you're looking at a three month turnaround. Where are we going to be in three months? Because you you can somewhat gauge based upon just having your your finger on the pulse of global news as well as the financial news. Where are you going to be in three months? And that that's where you that's where you invest. You hear about somebody say like. If I were investing in Tesla right now, or yeah. uh, I don't know what the solar company is that uh, Solar City, Solar City. Um, if I had the money, and um, again, you hear that Solar City is going to be making an amount announcement. When when we just had the rumors, we didn't actually have anything; just the rumors. Yeah. You can That's when you put in the money. You can watch it start to go up. <laughs> you, you, you can watch it start to go up. Yep. But that's when you soon – if that's on your feed the fir- first thing in the morning, you know precisely what you're investing in as soon as you get to the office. You put that money in, and you put 5% of that pension capital into Sun City. You see what happens after the announcement, and then you wait. You sit on it. For all of 12 hours, and then you sell everything. Yeah. That's that would that would be the way that. to make some money that day. Absolutely. And but if they stay yeah. in, then, you know, that if that stock continues to rise day over day over day, you know, yeah. then you've then it, you've missed out again. And but the, the thing the thing to really be concerned mentality. with here is that this is a pension fund. Yeah. By this its nature. Be- it needs to be stable and long term. Again, this is why you you <clears throat> invest in stuff that makes sense: municipal bonds, um, just bonds in general, but stuff that is going to give you a solid return. You, you again, you don't go heavily into the market. It's, it's things that are solid, things that are not going to fluctuate. By leaps and bounds, um, you want to invest. You want to invest even your midterm capital on more solid bets. People are going to still get sick, um, so investing into those uh, health and emergency services that are publicly traded—that's where you put money. Um, I want to. I want to get back to the article itself. Quoting, we missed a significant portion of the dot-com bubble, said the current South Carolina Retirement System Investment Commission CEO, Michael Hancock, Hitchcock. The timing of what happened, it was not good by any stretch of the imagination. It was the first in a series of ill-timed pension investing decisions, some allowed by additional voter-approved changes to the state constitution that resulted in the funds repeatedly buying stocks at high prices near peaks in the market. Regular folks saving for retirement are typically advised not to try to time the stock market as it rises and falls to avoid chasing investments that were there la- their, that were last year's winners and to avoid paying high fees. The pension managers did the opposite repeatedly with state lawmakers' encouragement. Fund managers essentially kept doubling down, devoting large chunks of the billions in pension funds to, to U.S. stocks right before market crashes that began in 2000 and 2007. They jumped into overseas stocks for the first time in 2007 when international markets peaked at values they haven't since revisited. Also in 2007, under then-Chief Investment Officer 
Robert Borden, the funds embraced expensive alternative investments, such as partnerships with hedge funds that wager on which assets may rise or fall in price, companies that try to buy and flip failing businesses for a profit, private real estate deals, and commodities such as cattle and gold. Borden, who used to tool around Columbia in a yellow Lamborghini sports car, was pulling down $485,000 state salary when he resigned in late 2011 for a job with a private investment group in North Carolina. There were tales of state officials being wined and dined once with a centerfold model, and partying with fund managers at posh New York City nightclubs. Loftus spread some of those tales, recounted in 2012 New York Times story, that observed, quote, It all sounds like one of those classic tales of a lot of public money meeting a little private greed of locals wooed by big city slickers. The RSIC's next chief investment officer, Herschel Harper, collected $300,000 performance bonus, on top of his $300,000 salary in 2013, which was one of those rare years when pension investment returns exceeded the state's target. That year, the total RSIC bonuses cost the state $600,000 more than the entire annual budget of the State Ethics Commission. That's just a nice framing device. Isn't it? Isn't it, though? I just like, oh, I I read that. It's like, oh, no, that's that done. 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 So South Carolina is hosed. There's no good news here. Again, pensions are a promise. That's what they are. Yeah. You're promising these people that you're going to wisely invest their money so that when they retire, they're taken care of. And they're giving you part of their paycheck. They're giving you their time, their blood, their sweat. They're giving you their hope. And this is what they were turned on. And honestly, in my opinion, what, why are we paying somebody a $300,000 bonus? A bonus. Doubling their the salary. Public, yeah. The public funds. Why? How? I don't get it. How is this possible? Oh. oh, Mr. Trump, I think we found some swamp for you to drain. Again. Yeah. For, for, uh, he, he, here's another thing. For someone with a $40,000 salary, about average for state employees, yeah. required pay deductions to the main pension fund now consume more than a month's pay each year. Required. Yeah. And that's just to start putting back in for the people they've already promised for. Oh, that's not a good thing. South Carolina's pension fund investments include alternatives such as private equity, in which investment firms buy companies and try to flip them for a profit. Pension managers listed Toys R Us as an example here. The Toys R Us store in North Charleston in 2013. <laughs> That's again, toys yeah. are no longer a thing. Toy stores are no longer a thing. Well, no, no. Okay. I, 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 I am a child of the 80s and 90s. I remember when Saturday morning cartoons were a thing. Yeah. When afternoon cartoons were a thing. When toys were heavily marketed, okay, that's yeah. gone by the wayside. Why? Somewhat. No, very much so. I remember when toy aisles were were a good chunk of your box stores. When you had, you know, even in Walgreens, <clears throat> a, a more diversified field than there is today. You know... You you do make you do make an excellent point because there used to be KB toys. Yep. Yeah. Uh, heck, there there even used to be full software stores. FAO Schwartz. Remember Walden Software? Yeah. Yeah. Babbages. FAO Schwartz. Yeah. Babbage's. No. Yeah. There, there were there were entire 
stores communities based around toys. That's not what it is anymore. Um, again, Disney, NBC, ABC, Fox, they invested in animation. Uh, they partnered with toy companies. Uh, cable channels like USA had entire blocks dedicated to children's entertainment. Yeah. That's gone. Um, and honestly, with, with, with pensions, you, yeah, those aren't the investments you make with a pension fund. That's not yeah. that that's just that all just all stop. Too, it was stupid. It's that's too much. And people risk. Got, I I am sick to death of people getting paid enormous sums of money to screw up royally. I mean, I and can screw up. Where's my money? And there's no <laughs> accountability. None. These people do their damage and leave. Yeah. And there's there's no criminal prosecution. There's no private prosecution. Um, and let's go back get, to bring up a uh, Bernie campaign thing of why aren't we talking about a maximum wage? Yeah. Oh, that was less Bernie and more uh, former Minnesota governor right. Jesse Ventura. Also, um, also Robert Reich. Yeah. yeah. But again, I. It's like, a good quip, but nobody's going to buy that. Nobody's going to yeah, take that. No. Hell, Eisenhower even had an idea of within the tax code creating tons one, more brackets one, and having one at a hundred percent. Yeah, I know we we talked about that before, and you know I, I still can't. It's like no, that no, you can never do that. But it, it no, you could if you made it so that you had to have certain deductions within the tax code that you had to yeah. donate a certain amount of money. Yeah, but the thing is, it would never look right. It would never look right a one hundred percent tax. I mean that 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 just smells wrong. Just I, know, I don't care who ha- you are. It's like no, a hundred percent taxes. That's all of it, right? Yeah, that's all of it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no. But when you're thinking that you know, instead of eight brackets, you would be having twenty five brackets. Yeah. I know there and, were there were a lot of brackets. I think it was something and you could yeah. you could as we've seen with with individuals uh like the Gateses, like JK Rowling, donate hell Warren Buffett, who again got into a little bit of a Twitter Twitter battle with Trump. Yeah. Or or war of words, went, Hi, here's my taxes. He released his tax forms. Yeah. And a ton of money was donated to charity, and not all of that was factored into his own taxes. He only claimed a portion of the amount that he donated to charity. A portion. Hmm. Which is actually how you get around that 100% tax. You make less money because you're giving it away because you're making so much you don't need it. Right. But there's so many people that that is such a foreign concept. You might as well be purple and a third gender. Hey, uh, you know, it, it's something that purple. they just. Nope. Can't wrap my head around that. That is a complete. Nope. Alien. Uh, I do I not understand. Therefore, I must so kill it. Finance that I'm. I understand. It. I know. I understand how you work it. Um, and you make it stick. Because, no, that would actually be your example of a maximum wage. That's how you, you in, impose that, is by having That's a diversified correct, enough, yeah. enough tax code yeah. that you have, you have that, that income ceiling. Um, that makes it so everybody has to do everything they can to not hit the ceiling. Yeah. I mean, we already have we already see examples of some CEOs saying, "My salary is a dollar." Yeah, your salary is right, but that's that's but. the income they can claim. Yeah, otherwise everything else is taken care of by the company anyway. Company expense accounts and this and that, and that you know whatever. So it doesn't matter. Or it doesn't all matter. these investments and stock options and right, yeah, all deferred investments <clears throat> that they won't ever get to 
you know, the, then it's the capital gains tax and things like that. You know, or the company is putting it in a um, IRA. Um, well, yeah, and... but, uh, well, I guess the company would be able to, but individual uh, contributions, you know, th- there's a cap on the limit that how much you can put into those. Yeah, but no. Which the, I think is can, dumb as well. The, the, the company can, what they can do is every year they can open an NRA, an IRA yeah. at the end of the year. Each one a separate one where yeah, you Yeah, there's no limit on how many of them you can have, yeah. Um, Just so, each account can only be up to a cert, certain amount of contribution yeah, per year. but they can keep hitting the top yeah. and just do that yearly. Yeah, yeah, but I mean the the yearly for that is like five thousand dollars. I mean it's really low, so you'd yeah, have, but that's you'd have just to do one something of else. Benefits. Yeah. Okay, I think that does it for this. So if you've enjoyed what we've done here and you'd like to help us out, there are a few ways. You can donate to the show through patreon.com slash Radio and get early access to the show content. You know, if you want to do it, do the money thing, there is also just a donate button out on the website. I, I removed that option because I really want you to do the Patreon. But, you know, if you just want a one-time donation, that's op- that option's there, too. I'm not going to stop you. You know, that'd be fine. Also, uh, reviews on iTunes, that always helps us gain audience. Uh, that raises us in the rankings and gets us in front of more eyeballs. And, of course, tell Telling somebody else about the show, that also gets us in front of more eyeballs, and that's very, very important to do. Of course, uh, you know, you could also talk to us, you know, engage us, send us a message on social media or electronic mail, you know, that whole email thing, Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're the more talkative sort, uh, we have that phone number, 470-222-6759. I know it better than my own number at this point. That's 470-222-6759. Five, nine. It just rolls off the tongue. It's always there to take your call or your text. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been a really radio part of the Random Axe Company. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, with the exception of the music created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com, who holds the copyright thereto. <laughs> <laughs>